All right, thank you, Dr. Leonard. So a little bit of a switch from my topic this morning, which is a bad disease with poor outcomes where we tolerate toxicity to get um, a, even a little bit of improvement in outcomes. Hodgkin's is a disease mostly of younger patients um, where we do cure a fair amount. And the idea that we really focus on is how do we cure those high-risk patients, but without sacrificing um, long-term toxicity in the patients that we're going to cure by being more aggressive. These are my disclosures. So just um, a little bit of background in Hodgkin's, but what I really want to point out here is advanced stage disease is stage three or four disease. But most of the trials we'll talk about today um, in advanced stage disease did include some stage two disease. And those are, they included patients with either stage two bulky disease or stage two B symptoms, as these patients have been shown to do worse um, than other early stage patients. Um, so for early stage and advanced stage Hodgkin's, there are different risk factors to predict outcomes. In advanced stage disease, we have the International Prognostic Score, um, which was developed after evaluating um, over 5,000 patients treated for um, initial therapy for Hodgkin's disease, and it defined seven independent risk factors that were predictive of both um, failure-free survival and overall survival. While this is, was a heterogeneously treated group, this was later validated in a cohort of patients all treated with ABVD and showed these seven factors to still be prognostic, although the outcomes um, for progression-free and overall survival were, were better. So um, turning to a patient case, so this is a 40-year-old male who presents with shoulder pain and swelling around his right upper chest wall. Um, biopsy, as you can see, was consistent with classical Hodgkin's disease, labs and PET are there. So we have a stage three patient with an IPS of one for male disease. ABVD has been the standard of care for advanced stage Hodgkin's. It's a randomized trial comparing it to MOP and a MOP ABVD hybrid showed no difference in outcomes um, but better tolerability with the ABVD. Since this time, research has really focused on how to, is there a way to improve upon ABVD therapy in those patients who do poorly. So the Germans have studied um, intensive regimens such as BACOP and escalated BACOP, and in a randomized um, phase three trial of a COP ABVD, BACOP, and escalated BACOP regimen, they did show a benefit to survival in those patients treated with escalated BACOP as compared to ABVD alone. However, this did not come without significant toxicity, including higher rates of secondary malignancy, higher rates of acute leukemia, much higher rates of severe cytopenias and febrile neutropenia. It renders patients um, infertile in the future, which ABV does not. Um, they later followed up this regimen by studying six cycles instead of eight cycles and did show that it was a little bit more tolerable. However, there have been numerous studies that have looked at varying um, uh, treatments with combination of escalated BACOP with BACOP or different numbers of cycles of BACOP and escalated BACOP. And while they've all shown um, a, an improvement in progression-free survival, none of them have shown a difference in overall survival with these patients. So we're improving progression-free survival, but not overall survival. And this is coming at the expense of toxicity and patient fertility. We're still able to cure about 70% of patients with ABVD. Is there a better way to predict those patients that we aren't curing? So besides the IPS score, what can we do? So there's been several studies that have shown that interim PET, somewhere between two, after two and four cycles of therapy, are predictive of outcomes. So those patients who are able to achieve an early PET negative state um, with their ABVD treatment have a much better outcomes than those patients who are still PET positive. So about 20% of patients will still be PET positive at their interim PET, while 80% will be PET negative. In those patients who are still, those 20% of patients who are still PET positive, it's been shown that outcomes are worse. So let's go back to my 40-year-old male with stage three non-bulky disease and an IPS of one. He had an interim PET after two cycles and a DOVO score of three, which is considered negative. So this is the Rathel study, and this study really looked at, we know those 80% of patients with PET negative disease do better, and those patients with PET positive disease do worse. So can we improve you know, the outcomes in those patients who are still PET positive by escalating therapy, but do we still need to continue that therapy, or can we de-escalate therapy in those patients who are PET 
um, <coughs> negative. So patients receive two cycles of ABVD, sorry, ABVD therapy and then had an interim PET scan. Those patients who were PET negative were randomized to four more cycles of ABVD versus four cycles of AVD, the BLEO was eliminated. Those patients who were PET positive were escalated to be a cop. So in this study, they showed that by those patients who had an interim PET negative, so those more favorable patients, that de-escalating and removing the BLEO after two cycles, AVD was non-inferior in the, all of these subgroups. You did not lose disease control. Um, and as you can see here, the three-year PFS and three-year OS was no different. So back to my patient, he received two cycles of ABVD, interim PET negative, and then de-escalated to AVD. Um, this trial also, so as I mentioned before, these are young patients and you worry about sh both short and long-term toxicities. So one of the concerns with bleomycin is this um, pulmonary toxicity. And this trial did show that um, in patients where you were able to remove the bleo, you were able to decrease the rate of pulmonary events um, and pulmonary toxicity. So let's go to another patient. This is a 25-year-old with several months of shoulder pain and shortness of breath. CT showed a large mediastinal mass. Biopsy was consistent with classical Hodgkin's. PET had multiple areas of lymph node disease above and below the diaphragm and spleen. Stage three diagnosis, IPS2 for albumin and white blood cell. This patient was treated with two cycles of ABVD. However, the interim PET, while it showed significant improvement in some areas, still showed a fair amount of disease. So there have been several studies in advanced stage Hodgkin's looking at interim PET after two cycles and escalating therapy for those patients, that 20% of patients who have poor outcomes. Um, here listed is four different studies that have shown, again, similar to all the other studies, about 20% of patients will still be PET positive after two cycles of ABVD. In all, these, um, in all these trials that escalated, however, they showed that the PFS, as opposed to being 15 to 20%, was brought up to somewhere between 50 to 65% when you escalated therapy to be a cop from ABVD. So this is the um, other half of the Rathel study curves that showed when you escalated um, with escalated BIACOP, the three-year PFS was 67.5 percent, um, and there was no significant difference in um, higher count problems. And then the first random, the first study to be reported that actually looked at escalation um, and was dedicated to this was a U.S. intergroup study that again gave two cycles of ABVD and then PET scan for those patients that were PET negative. They continued with four more cycles of ABVD, and for those patients that were PET positive, they were escalated to six cycles of BIACOP. And as you can see here, this in the PET negative disease at the two-year um, estimate of progression-free survival was 82%, similar to what other studies have shown. And escalating to be a cop, while it doesn't bring it up to the um, PET negative disease, it did increase the two-year progression-free survival to 64%, suggesting that there is a benefit in patients who are PET positive to escalation of therapy. Next patient case. So this is a 46-year-old male who presents with cough, fevers, night sweats, and left cervical lymphadenopathy. His biopsy um, pathology is listed, but again, consistent with a classical Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, his labs are listed, and he gets a point for his white blood cell, his albumin, his age, and being male. So his IPS is four, so in that higher risk four to seven categories. His PET showed diffuse hypermetabolic lymphadenopathy above and below the diaphragm, spleen involvement, liver involvement, and diffuse marrow uptake. And in addition to his high-risk disease, he had PFTs that um, showed a re reduced DLCO. I apologize for the DLCO. Um, reduced DLCO even when adjusted for hemoglobin. So, brentuximab vodotin, as you heard in the um, T-cell lymphoma talk this morning, this is an antibody drug conjugate that targets CD30. 
This has been shown in relapsed Hodgkin's to have an overall response rate of 72%, with the biggest toxicity being peripheral neuropathy, and has been approved both in uh, relapsed Hodgkin's disease and as maintenance after transplant in patients um, with high-risk relapsed Hodgkin's disease. There was a phase one study that looked at combining ABVD plus ABVD plus brentuximab. They showed that early on in that study, patients that got bleomycin in addition to brentuximab had a very high rate of pulmonary toxicity, and therefore they continued the study, but they removed the bleomycin only treating patients with ABD plus BV, and that showed favorable outcomes. And based on that was the Echelon 1 trial, which was a randomized phase 3 trial of A plus ABD versus ABVD in patients with newly diagnosed advanced stage Hodgkin's disease. This trial did include only stage 3 or 4 disease patients. They had an interim pet in this trial, although they did not act upon the interim pet. So the final results of this trial did show a modified PFS benefit by independent review of the um, brentuximab vedotin plus AVD as compared to AVD with um, a median follow-up of 24.9 months. The two-year progression-free survival with the BV plus AVD was 82.1% of patients, whereas with ABVD was 77.2% of difference. So that 5% was significant in this study. This is a forest plot of the modified PFS um, per subgroup. And while a number of them did favor, they were not all statistically significant. But I just pointed out a few things that you can see. Age, stage four disease, and male gender were all significantly in favor of the BV plus AVD. And the um, high IPS of four to seven did trend okay. towards that. Um, now, I talked a little bit before about how we don't want to sacrifice, um, how we want to be careful with toxicity. In this um, study, they did show that there was a higher rate of neutropenia and febrile neutropenia in the AVD plus BV arm. However, they did um, mandate growth factor after this was noticed, and so this regimen should be given with growth factor when it is done, and that decreased the rates and brought them down to that is similar to is seen with ABVD. The other thing was concern for peripheral neuropathy, the side effect of the BV, and then pulmonary events, which we see with bleomycin. So there was a higher rate of peripheral neuropathy we seen with the brentuximab vedotin, although in two-thirds of patients, this had decreased to um, grade one or less at last follow-up. In pulmonary toxicity, there was a higher rate of pulmonary toxicity in the bleomycin arm as compared to the AVD plus BV arm. So my approach to Hodgkin's disease. So I still use ABVD in the majority of advanced, um, advanced stage disease patients. When do I consider AVD plus BV? I don't consider this in every patient, and I don't necessarily consider it a new standard, but I do consider it in select patients. So in a patient who has a contraindication to bleomycin, so a patient who is an active smoker, a patient who has a strong history of smoking, um, a patient with poor DLCO on PFTs, I will consider um, this substitution. And then in patients with stage four disease um, and or patients with um, a high IPS, so that IPS of four to seven, I do discuss um, this treatment with them as opposed to standard ABVD. How do I use interim PET? So an interim PET after two cycles. So if a patient is PET negative after two cycles, as defined by Doville 1 to 3, I do drop the bleomycin, so they get 2-8-BVD, followed by 4-AVD. PET positive patients, I think, are a little bit trickier, and this is for a few reasons. Um, number one is that when you have a PET, you know, PET positive is Doville 4 to 5. Um, so I, that can be anywhere from a patient who's had gotten two cycles of ABVD and essentially had you know, no response or very minimal reduction in their disease um, and probably does benefit from, from escalation, um, if not you know, consideration of salvage therapy and transplant. 
And then you have those patients who had a significant disease burden were treated and they have, you know, one lymph node that's still pet active um, with an SUV 0.5 above liver and normal size. And I really don't think, you know, while that's a positive pet that those patients, it's worth escalating um, therapy in them. It's also not clear um, as far as overall survival. We have really great therapies in relapse Hodgkin's and we have the ability to salvage many patients, which is why a lot of the BIACOP and ABVD studies showed no difference in overall survival because despite an increased risk of relapse, patients were able to be salvaged with their salvage therapy and autologous stem cell transplant. And so I think that, you know, even when you're thinking about escalating to be a cop, this really needs to be a discussion with a patient um, about consideration of, you know, infertility, the possibility of salvage with transplant, um, in those discussions before you make a final decision.